Hebrew because that's what God called them. God didn't call them Jews. You know why? There's no letter J in the Hebrew alphabet. So how can they be called Jews? They didn't call themselves Jews. There was no letter J. How about Jeremiah? How about Jonah? How about Jesus? Jonah. There's no letter J in their language. But they didn't speak English, neither. <laughs> see, these words come from an English language, you see. So what is a Hebrew? Abraham was the first to be called a Hebrew. Amen? In, um, in Genesis, a it says Abraham, Abraham came from, Bab Abraham was a Babylonian. That, that's where he came from, from the land of Ur, Babylonian uh, in the land of Ur of the Chaldees. He was called the Hebrew. And you know, and it's funny, when God called Abraham a Hebrew, the word doesn't tell us. Abraham didn't ask, what does that mean? And God never explained it. Now, um, I know now why, but that's another study, but that's another lesson. But I just want to point out the fact that when God called him a Hebrew, God never explained what that was, and he never asked what it was. He was the father of the Hebrew people. We don't find out what a Hebrew is until many, 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 many years later. During the time when the children were Israel were in bondage in Egypt. And Moses was called by God from the burning bush to go get the people out of Egypt and bring them back to the mound, back to the mountain where he first saw the burning bush and God spoke to him. He brought them right back to the same spot. And God spoke to them. They said they s heard his voice in thunders. They saw his words in flashes of lightning. And they all said, yes, Lord. See, God touched every aspect of their life. He told them how to dress. Each tribe had a, had, had, you know, the w each tribe had a different design in their clothes. You could see what he was wearing and know what tribe he was from. That's why in the parable of, of the Samar Good Samaritan, uh, of the man that was on the road, they said he was, he was beaten, stripped, and half dead. See, that's why they couldn't identify if he was a neighbor or not, because he was stripped. He had no identification clothes on. Anyway, that's another story. Um, God touched every aspect of their life. He, he told them ab about their clothing. He told them what to eat, what not to eat, how to, how to kill it, how to cook it, how to keep it fresh with what we call kosher now, how, how, how to keep it. Amen? He told them about relationships between, within the family, relationship with strangers. He touched every aspect of their life. And you know, in essence, what God did? He sanctified them. See, I, I, got, I got three items up here on this table. I'm going to sanctify this Bible, okay? Watch what I do. I set it apart from the rest. That's sanctification. Oh. See, it's not, it's not a Holy Spirit. It's not, it's not a spiritual woo-woo thing, sanctification. It's being set apart. He set them apart from the rest of the world. How? By giving them a lifestyle different than everyone else. A lifestyle. Not a religion. Oh. Because when, when he called Abraham a Hebrew, you notice he didn't change the shape of Abraham's nose. <laughs> he didn't change the texture of his hair. He didn't change the color of his skin. 
He didn't make a new race of people. <laughs> he gave them a lifestyle. That's what made them Hebrew. Because they all said, yes, Lord. We will obey. That's what made them Hebrew. What makes you a Christian? Is it, is it who your mother and father is? Is it where you was born? Is it the color of your skin? Is it the shape of your head? No. Why? What is it? It's because you said yes to the Lord. The Lord said, I change not. The Hebrews said, the people said yes to the Lord. That made them Hebrew. You say yes to the Lord. That makes you Christian. It's not a race. See, see, the, see I, I want to make a statement to you. The Jews of today are not the Hebrews of the Bible. Because the Jews of today have become a race of people or a political set. See? A race of people. But who all said yes to the Lord? I don't want to get, get too deep off into that because that's another story. But all these people that came up out of Egypt, right? The Bible says over 600,000 men of the Hebrew nation came out of Egypt, besides the women and children. 600,000 men, besides the women and children. Then it says a whole host of others. And what does that mean? See, Egypt was a was a hub. It was it was a it was a it was a district where it was a place where people come all over the world to trade and do business. People were there from other parts of Africa, from 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 Asia, from from Europe, from from all over the known world. People were there, and just imagine if they're there doing all these plagues, these ten plagues that have happened, and they see that these people that call Hebrews and Israel. That their God is causing these things. And now Pharaoh is telling them, do as you ask. Go. <laughs> I'm going with them. <laughs> you see, God is with them. They got favor. A lot of people left with them and went to that mountain where God spoke to everybody's life. And God gave them a lifestyle. And the Bible says they all says yes. They all says yes. Now, the Bible doesn't tell how long they stayed there. But, but we know that, 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 that uh, all these people were there, the 600,000 men, women, children, and a host of others. And then here comes Jethro. Everybody know Jethro? We know who he is and who he was. The priest of the Midianite, right? That's what the Bible calls him, the priest of the Midianite. Do we know who the Midianites are today? Ethiopians. See, I, I haven't left my subject. Black history, right? <laughs> he was an Ethiopian. He was an African. Moses' father-in-law. Moses married an Ethiopian. So now here's Jethro and all his people. He was a priest of the Midianites. He was a nomad. He roamed and went wherever he went, he, wherever he wanted to go and had respect. Now, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But Jethro and all his people are there. Now, the Bible doesn't say how long they stayed there. But there came a time when God told Moses, okay, it's time to leave and go into the promised land. Okay? Moses went to his father-in-law, Jethro, because God can use Jethro in many, many aspects to help Moses govern these people. Moses is trying to do everything, wearing himself out. And, and God spoke through Jethro, and Jethro went to Moses and said, you're doing too much, son. Get you a, a, a leader from each tribe, and you deal with them and let them deal with the people. See, that's structure. That's organization. That's government. So anyway, when Mo God, Moses went to Jethro and said, come and go with us. You, you'll find this in Numbers, the 10th chapter. Let's read it. Numbers 10.
tenth chapter. Everybody with me? Am I in the right place? I'm sorry. Yeah, number ten, and the. Get there was in one of the ten numbers. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place. Y'all bear with me for a minute. Somebody Google something for me on your phone. Be our eyes in the wilderness. Be our eyes in the wilderness. No one got it? Google it. Numbers 1031. Okay. I was in the vicinity now. Yes, Numbers 10, 31. And And verse 30 before that, he said, I will not, but I, I, I will not go. I will not, I will depart to my own land and my own kindred. See, Moses went to Jethro and said, come and, and lead us to this promised land God has given us. And Jethro, this so-called black man, man, said no. This was the first time the so-called black man said no to God. Mm. You ought to pick this up and still later. This is the first time the so-called black man said no to God. And many, 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 many generations later, God had to shackle this black man and bring him to a promised land called America. Because he refused to go to the first promised land. And we hear so many complaining, the white man this, the struggle this, the man this. They're doing this and that to us. They got us in bondage. This is the work of the Lord. Can you imagine if we were never brought here, what you would be doing probably right now? Probably in a civil war somewhere. Some of the women over there don't even have underwear, decent underwear. They just tie rags around them. Children killing children. These little boys be carrying rifles. Look at what God has done. Look at what God has done. Hmm. 
I get to rolling with this, with, 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 with this teaching, and sometimes I get a little bit ahead of myself because it gets busy. But what I want to show you now, we're going to get back to that finger right there. We're going to come back to that. I'm not talking, not that page, but, but where I'm at, that point, okay? But let's go to the book of Acts. Because, see, we've already talked about in the Old Testament, we looked at the map of where the Gentiles are. We've, uh, uh, we've examined the difference between Hebrew and Gentile. We, we've looked at the Hebrew versus the Christian. They both said yes to the Lord. It's not about a race. See, it's about a culture. See, I believe the word race is a word injected into mankind to bring division. Every time you say the word race or you, or, 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 or you, or you think about the word race, immediately separation comes because you're dividing. You're dividing peoples, biasness. You're dividing. God is not about that kind of a division. See, I think it's more about the differences. It's more about culture than it is about race. Because, see, you could take a, what we call a black man and put him, I'm, I'm reminded of Fresh Prince, <laughs> you know, you put him in the hills of Beverly Hills or, or in a white society, and pretty soon he'd he, he be, he be looking like Carlton, right? He'd have a sweater tied around his neck with a tennis racket saying, tally ho. <laughs> or you could take a white boy and you could put him in the ghetto, and pretty soon his pants is dragging, his, head, his hat is turned to the side, because his culture has nothing to do with race. It's culture. Are we in the book of Acts? I'm going to give you another witness here. Now, we all know Paul, right? Paul wrote, what, uh, what they say, a third of the Bible? What was Paul's mission? Paul's mission to take the gospel where? To the Gentiles. We back at, we, we still talking about the Gentiles. To take the gospel to the Gentiles. Was Paul successful? Yes. Paul completed his task? Yes. Paul said, I'm going to run this race in a fashion in which to win so that I myself may not be disqualified. He was on his task. He did what God called him to do. He said, I'm reaching for the prize. But isn't there a scripture that says salvation is to the Jew first, then the Gentile? Keep that in mind. Let's go to the eighth chapter of Acts. Paul, or before he's called Paul, this is about Saul. Saul was doing what? Saul was persecuting, killing, murdering, pillaging the saints. Those who was followers of Christ. Amen. And so in this eighth chapter, is a story of an evangelist named Philip. And in the 12th verse, it says, but when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, every, both men and women. I'm going to jump over to another. I, I just like reading that scripture. <laughs> Why? Because it talks about, it, it tells us exactly what, what, what Philip was doing. He was preaching the things concerning what? The kingdom of God. See, many times 
many times. One of the mistakes that the church has made in our preaching and teaching of the gospel, we're preaching and teaching the gospel about Christ, about the man, about what he did, about how he did it, about what he said, about how he said it. But we fail to teach and preach the message that he preached and teached. See, we're preaching about him, but not about the message. And his message was the kingdom of God is at hand. Everything else he did after that, eyesight to the blind, lame to walk, dead to rise, was to show them the kingdom of God. We preach and teach what Christ preached and teach none of the time, and we never the time teach and preach what he taught all the time. <laughs> But let's drop down to verse 26. This is about Philip. Philip, the evangelist, says, The angel of the Lord spoke unto Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south unto the way that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert. Now, desert is a dry place. Desert is a barren place. Desert is a place that needs water. That's where he's sending him. That's where we need to be going, to the desert. See, we gather in these places. <laughs> we gather in these places. I call it hauling water to the ocean. Because most everybody in here is saved already. But yet we are gathering here and we preach to everybody. And the desert is still dry. Hauling water to the ocean. The ocean don't need more water. The desert needs the water. Ah. Hmm. So now, and it says, and verse 27 says, and he rose and went. He obeyed. And behold, a man of, oh, Ethiopia. A man of Ethiopia. A eunuch of great authority. This is an African man with great authority. Where did authority come from? Under Queen Candace of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure. My, my, my. He's in charge of all her money. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. Now, why is an Ethiopia going to Jerusalem to worship? Why is an Ethiopian going to Jerusalem to worship? I'm going to run you back just a little bit. Remember when they was at the mountain, when Moses brought the children of Israel out, and God spoke to everybody and gave them a new lifestyle? All these people, all 600,000 men, women, and a host of others, and who else was there? Jethro. Jethro was a priest of who? The Midianites. Who are the Midianites? Ethiopians. <laughs> so I'm trying to connect dots for you guys. See, that's what I do. I connect dots. You can have all these scriptures that are like dots on a piece of paper. But until you take a, a pencil, an apparatus, or a teacher, and you start connecting dots, then you can say, oh, I see the big picture now. I'm just trying to connect dots for you. Okay. That's why he was in Jerusalem worshiping. That tells us he, they continued to live the lifestyle that was given at the mountain. <laughs> He's a Hebrew. Why else would he go to Jerusalem to worship? History Month. He went to Jerusalem. Now, you know, if we believe what, what, what the world says, 
Africans are tree worshippers, stone worshippers, sun, all kind of gods worshippers, you know, idol worshippers, you know, heathens, savages. But here's one that went to Jerusalem to worship. So whose report you going to believe? It says, and he was returning home, and he was sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah the prophet. Here's an African man reading a Hebrew scripture. And it wasn't written in English. <laughs> It wasn't written in, in Ethiopian. It was written in Hebrew because they wrote it in Hebrew. And the spirit of the Lord said to Philip, verse 29, go near and join yourself to the chariot. And Philip ran. And when Philip got there, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. And he said, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I accept someone would guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up, get up in the chariot with me and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read, I'm on verse 32, was this, that he was led as a sheep to the slaughter like a lamb, dumb before his shears, so opened he not his mouth. And he said, in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who shall declare his generation? For his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, I pray thee, of whom does this prophet speak? Of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture, and he preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, hope, here is some water. What do it hinder me? Well, what's going to stop me from being baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stop. So you see, he wasn't driving himself. He had a driver. He had a chauffeur. He commanded the chariot.